What's going on guys? Welcome to another video brought to you by The Simple Engineer. Uh, today we are going to be continuing part three of programming in Prolog. And we are going to be covering structs and their implementation, how they're used and what they're used for. Uh, we'll take a look at scope and where certain variables can be accessed within rules as well as operators and arithmetic functions, which kind of deal with the mathematical side of Prolog, um, which you'll start to realize that uh, Prolog's ability to manipulate numbers is actually very weak. And um, then we'll be looking at Swish. And actually, uh, I'm going to be starting the video looking at Swish. And what Swish is, is a web application that I've recently found that is basically a text editor and compiler all in one. You have syntax highlighting for your code. You have your ability to query and ask questions here and then your output here. And I'll put this link in the description. Very, very useful program. Okay, so without further ado, we are going to be getting started with structs. Okay, so I went ahead and built this um, just imaginary program here and I created some class. So you can see here I have a course called CSE 340 and it's during the day of Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 to 1, and the professor is Bryce Holton and it's in the building Core 300. I created another course, CSE 340, same name, same day, same time, different instructor and different building, okay? I then created a rule, okay? And this rule says that someone is the instructor of a class if and only if it matches these parameters. But one thing that you shouldn't forget is that this structure is really just a rule. I've just organized it in a way that it looks nice, okay? so. I have course, I have all my parameters, just a regular fact, it's just a regular fact, and then I have a rule, and in the rule, um, it's satisfied if and only if it matches these parameters um, of the fact, okay? So if this returns true, then this is true. So what we're saying in the body is that the course class matches with class, we, ha we don't care about the day, we don't care about the time, um, the instructor matches with the instructor and we don't care about the building and then we're gonna end this fact. So we've programmed our facts, we've made the conditions for our rule, now let's query it and see what we can uh, output here. So we wanna know, first of all, who is the instructor of CSE 340? We wanna know who the instructor of CSE 340 is. Okay, well, we know, um, without looking at the dialog box yet, the output, we know that Bryce Holton is the instructor and Ivan Anderson is the instructor. So here uh, we have Bryce Holton, good. Then we'll go next and Ivan Anderson. Okay, good. And then it stops because that's all we have. However, if I were to go, let's say, put in instructor John, let's say John Johnson. Obviously, this is going to be outputting false because we haven't programmed John Johnson as an instructor here. But if we change the parameter here from Ivan Anderson to John Johnson, John Johnson now an instructor of CSE 340. I could recompile this and you see it's true, okay? I could then change the parameters here in the query to Bryce Holton for CSE 340. Up, oh, that's true because we know that he is indeed a instructor for CSE 340. You can ignore this false. That's just uh, part of the. That's just a syntax, a semantic error there. Okay, so that is uh, kind of how you build structs and how you query structures and implement them within your uh, rules. It's very easy, very simple to use, and very handy as well. Uh, next thing we are going to jump into is scope. 
And the scope of a variable, something you want to realize is the scope of a variable only exists within the fact, rule, or query that contains the variable. So let's go ahead and do an example. I'm going to erase this previous code here because it's no longer needed. Okay. So let's create a rule saying that some person ate a grilled cheese sandwich. So we're saying some person ate a grilled cheese sandwich if and only if that person ate some cheese and that person ate some bread. Okay, so we're saying that some person ate a grilled cheese sandwich if and only if the person ate cheese and the person ate bread. So what you notice here is the variable that we are dealing with is person, okay? Person is instantiated three different times within this rule, okay? But one thing that you need to realize is, okay, it's used here, and we can reuse it here within the rule, but if I was gonna go create some fact called, or another rule, let's say, let's say, eight to person, uh, let's just say grilled cheese again. Okay, and eight person cheese one, and eight person cheese two. What you need to realize is that person, this person instantiated in this rule in eight is not the same person instantiated in eight two, okay? Because person dies after this period is added after the last fact in the rule, okay? So person, okay, we can use it here, we can use it here, we can use it here, here, here. Oh, period, okay, now it's gone. Now any other person that's gonna be instantiated in another rule is gonna be some new person. So these two people are not the same because they're instantiated after a period and you need to realize that a new person is going to be added into the rule. So the scope of person only exists within this rule. And that's really all you need to know about scope. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, you'll start to realize how it works once you make some uh, different rules and you'll understand where it can be used and where it cannot. Okay, so last we are going to be looking at operators and arithmetic functions. Um, something to know is that Prolog's weakness is the ability to manipulate numbers. It's really not very good at it just because it is in the logic paradigm. Um, however, there are built-in functions that allow this method to be a little easier, and we'll take a look at that. So something to note is that to assign values, so say we want to assign values, it follows a basic um, structure, and that is that we have some variable is, and then we have the arithmetic, arithmetic operation. So an example of this is saying, say we want some variable x, we want to instantiate a variable x, and we want to assign it to 7 plus 3, we would just say x is 7 plus 3, or we could also say x is 10. Okay, same thing. Um, this is how you would say, this is the equivalent to like saying something in maybe C++ where you go X equals 10. This is the same thing, but in Prolog. Okay, so that's how you assign values. So we'll just go through some, some basic arithmetic operations. They're very similar to... Um, other programming languages with the exception of just a couple. So 
if we want to do addition, like I just said, we have x is 3 plus 2. For subtraction, we go x is 5 minus 4. x is 3 times 2. And x is 5 over 2. So none of this is surprising. Um, the output would be 5, 1, 6, and 5 over 2 would be 2.5, okay? However, a couple different ones, if we want to do integer division, so 5 over 2 here would yield 2.5, but in integer division, we could do 5 slash slash 2, and that would yield 2 because we can't have decimal numbers. Um, if we want to do mod, we could do 75 mod 12. That just yields 3. And we could do x is 2 asterisk asterisk 3, which would raise it to the power of 3, and that would be 8. Okay? So these are some basic arithmetic operations that you can do. It's very simple, very easy to use and understand. So now let's take our knowledge of arithmetic operations and create a rule. So I'll go ahead and bring up our Swish program. And what we're going to do is create a rule to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Okay, so we'll create a couple, um, create a couple facts here. And we'll say the average temperature in Phoenix, Arizona is 100 degrees. And the average temperature of San Francisco, California is, we'll say, 68 degrees. Okay. We'll just create a couple facts. Okay. Now, our rule, something to remember is that converting Celsius, you need Celsius equals whatever the Fahrenheit is, minus 32 times five over nine. Okay, so this is the equation. Now we just need to throw this into a basic rule. So we'll say the average temp in Celsius is you need the location and then you need the Celsius temperature. If and only if, and we'll say the average temp of whatever the location is with the Fahrenheit. And we'll say C temp, C temp is, and then this is where we throw in the equation. We have F temp minus 32 times 5 and then we're doing integer division 5 over 9 because we don't want any decimals and then we end this okay so let's go ahead and walk through what we have so we're saying the average temp so this is average temp in Fahrenheit so 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 68 degrees Fahrenheit for these two locations respectively and then we created a rule the average temp in Celsius for some location and then we want to find the Celsius temperature. So average temp of Phoenix for some Celsius temperature is, and we'll pass through the parameter. So now we have this in the scope here, the scope of the rule. And C temp is, and then we're using the F temp from the parameter of the average temp call in our Celsius equation, which we defined right here. So let's just go ahead and do a test. So we'll say average temp Celsius of Phoenix, and then we'll say Cels is, oh, and it looks like we ran into an error. So what would our error be? Let's go ahead and say C temp. Okay, average temp up, oh, we're missing an S there, C temp. Okay, so now you see C temp is 37. And if we wanted to double check that, we could go to 
um, let's say 100 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius and you see 37.7777 knowing that we did integer division here is why we don't get the floating point numbers I could change this to 5 slash 9 rerun it and we would get 37.7778 which would match what we uh, googled there uh, just as another test I could throw San Francisco in there and hit enter so 20 so we could just double check 68 degrees Fahrenheit whoops to Celsius and we get 20 okay so what you see here is we've implemented the use of a variable assignment and arithmetic operations within a rule and now you can really see how this is useful for calculating certain types of data um, through the manipulation of numbers so that really covers our tutorial today i was going to implement um, recursion in this video however that's a little bit more of a more in-depth topic so that'll probably have a video of itself in part four so stay tuned and i hope to see you in the next video